O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. I will leave in the midst of you an afflicted and a poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. So very many prophecies are given in the Old Testament concerning the coming of the Lord that we celebrate and rejoice as the Christmas season approaches. As a matter of fact, we know from the teachings of the Word to the New Church that everything in the Old Testament is connected with, and as it were, a prophecy of the Lord's coming and the glorification of His human. We can spend our whole lives studying and trying to understand these teachings because we wish for the Lord to come to us. We wish for Him to be in our house. We wish to rejoice with exceedingly great joy that we may enter into his house, as the wise men mentioned in the recitation rejoiced with exceedingly great joy when they saw the star and then when they entered. Passover is not generally considered a pre-Christmas subject. Think about Passover and you tend to connect it with Easter. And you should, because it was the Lord attending the Passover celebrations that were taking place just before his crucifixion. But the Passover is a prophecy as well of the Lord's coming to us, the Lord's birth within our lives. All of the rescue stories in the Word are stories of the Lord coming to us, rescuing us, even though the subject is perhaps a little bit hard to understand. How does that apply to me? The first story of hope, Genesis 3.15, we're talking about the serpent, which shall be crushed as to its head by the Messiah, but who would bruise the heel. This was known to be the first prophecy spoken of in the early passages of the Word. And we're told from that time on, people had hope in the coming of the Lord, which I preached about last weekend. Hope in the coming of the Lord and being kept in that hope is so very important. And isn't it easy to lose hope? Isn't it easy to lose track of what we're trying to celebrate as the things of the natural world seem to get us distracted? The concerns we have... I mentioned all the rescue stories are stories about the Lord's coming to us. Abraham was rescued out of his homeland and brought into a land flowing with milk and honey. That description is used much later, but it became a land where he became exceedingly wealthy. And he was rescued from the hand of the Philistines and the hand of those people who were in that portion of the country. In chapter 12 and chapter 20 and chapter 26, each time he asks his wife to pretend she's his sister, to rescue him from being killed by those who would take his wife by killing him and then be free to have her. These are prophecies of the Lord's coming to us in the internal sense. We learn about these things. Jacob escaping from the anger of his brother finding himself with Laban, and then escaping from Laban, and finding himself in the anger of his brother. But his brother, at the end of that story, was not angry. So Jacob, as you know, spent many, many years acquiring two wives and many children and great flocks, and then has to escape from Laban. Again, it's a prophecy of the Lord's coming. It's a prophecy about his life within us, and how in each stage of our life, the Lord is rescuing us all the time. You think of the Joseph story, you think of so many rescue issues taking place there. One of the brothers rescued him from the others. Didn't want to slay him, but threw him into the pit. And he was taken down into Egypt, as it were, rescued and kept alive. Don't think about that as a rescue story. He's made a slave eventually. He's thrown into jail. 
And the Lord continually rescues Joseph, doesn't he? It's a prophecy of what the Lord does to us all the time when we are enslaved or thrown into the pit, when we're down and out. When the Lord comes to us and rescues us from situations in which we find ourselves very victimized, like Joseph, Pharaoh's wife, trying to seduce him and then setting him up by leaving her garment in his hand, his garment in her hand. The Lord rescued Joseph over and over again until Joseph eventually rescued all the rest of his family. They meant it for evil, but the Lord meant it for good. Can we look at the rescues of our lives? Can we look at those things in which we might not yet feel rescued from? Perhaps as evil is taking place, but the Lord is going to change them into something good. The biggest rescue, perhaps in all of the earlier sections of the Old Testament, is the one that we've covered a little bit today in the Passover story. 400, over 400 years, those people who had been rescued and brought into Egypt to be nurtured and nourished by Joseph and their leader have now become slaves. And generation after generation after generation know nothing else than what it is to be a slave. Now stop and ask yourself if that state you're in right now. Hopefully, if you're being honest, you will say, yep. To some extent, here or there, yes. Why else am I in church? Unless I'm asking the Lord to help me, to continue to rescue me from myself, from my evil and false inclinations and ideas, to give me something from this word, to lift me up out of the pit, and to enlighten me, that something may shine in my mind and I may rejoice, seeing the star of the Lord's word with exceedingly great joy. So in chapter 3 and 4, then 9 through 12, all those chapters having to do with the plagues that are brought upon the Egyptians, we're talking about our own captivity. We're also talking about the Lord's glorification. What power do the hells have over you? And as we come to celebrate Christmas, we're asking ourselves, how can I celebrate? How can I truly celebrate this season with humility and innocence? So that the Lord really does enter into my house, my mind, and I can rejoice with exceedingly great joy that I can enter into His temple and praise Him. The Lord came on earth to save mankind. That's you. That's me. He came as a historical thing, and we must see it as a right now event, a present, a present thing. Had He not come historically, we would not be able to contemplate our own slavery and our own freedom. And all the things that are represented by the Passover that help us to truly celebrate this birth on earth. Because this took place, as we know, very much before the coming of the Lord. And many, many other states had to take place. Moses is called by the Lord. And Moses couldn't believe his eyes. Let me turn aside and see this thing. As I mentioned earlier, he had to take off his shoes later on. Wear your shoes. Those different states where we're in front of the Lord in humility, where we take off our shoes. We sit quietly contemplate what the Lord is showing us. And when the Lord shows us that we must shun evils as sins, we need to get out of there right away with haste. Moses was told about rescuing the children of Israel. He had been far away from them for many, many years, in the literal sense. He's up on the mountain of the Lord, sees the burning bush, and the Lord calls him, take off his shoes, you're in a holy place. I have heard the cry of my people who are afflicted. In short, you're going to rescue them. And chapter 3 and 
Benjamin are talking about, he's going to have the Egyptians spoiled. You know, they're going to be, going to be um, conquered, and you're going to take riches out of there. And Moses' response in chapter 4, the beginning of chapter 4, is, I can't do it. I can't even talk. It says the Lord's anger was aroused, and he said to Moses, Who gives man his mouth to speak? I do. But okay, as it were, the Lord said, Aaron will be your spokesperson. I will speak to you, and you will be as a God to Aaron. He will be your mouth. He says, Aaron's on his way, by the way, as we speak, and he's happy he's going to meet you. And Moses and Aaron meet and kiss, and the Lord gives the commandment to those two that to take this message, you're going to leave Egypt, and you're going to spoil the Egyptians, and there's going to be a plague at the end of which the Egyptians will lose their firstborn. This was predicted long before it all started. The Lord sees in our lives exactly what he has to do to get us to leave our slavery. And in many ways, it's just not a pretty picture. We can live with that, right? We can accept what we're like, right? We can know that we're inclined towards evils and falsities of every kind. Most people don't want to dwell in that kind of thought. It's just uncomfortable. It makes them squirm. And people say, people don't want to come to church and hear about that, so just preach the good things, all the things that make everybody happy. But wouldn't that be a disservice to really what the Lord's trying to get us to do? And wouldn't that just be staying in Egypt and just hoping that the plagues pass you over? Wouldn't that be having all the water of life that we have received be twisted and perverted into the blood? That was the first sign of the place. Everything's fine. This is great stuff, my God. The water of life the Lord gives us in the Word. Yeah, we do want to keep it pure and clean as crystal like it talks about at the end of the Word. But during the middle part of our spiritual life, as we approach the Lord to truly worship Him, we must see that if left to ourselves, we will totally pervert and twist everything that the Lord gives us, the first play. Take some water and pour it on the ground. It was the first sign, one of the three signs, that the Lord gave to Moses as well. He said, take your serpent, throw it down, it comes into a serpent. Or you take your stick, throw it down, it becomes a serpent. Put your hand in here, it becomes leprous. And then take some water. So these three signs are going to convince the Israelites, and this is the first sign I'm going to use to try to get the Egyptians, Pharaoh, to leave. And we know throughout the story, Pharaoh says, yeah, no, yeah, go, go, go. That says the Lord hardened his heart. That's an appearance. That's like us saying, oh, this is bad, this is terrible, I'll never do that again, whatever it might be. And then the fear of whatever it is passes, and then you're right back at it. We're all like that. Right? You're not alone. I'm not alone. We're all like that. That's why the story's in the Word. We're all like that. But one of the first things we want to do is take all the good things of life and say it's ours. And that's like the first sign. It's also the horse seen coming out of the apocalypse. Red. You think red's a great color. It is. But when we pervert the things of the word, it's not good blood. It's bad blood. It's bad blood that we must the Lord. And it plagues us until we can leave it. You know, the second plague was frogs coming out, covering the land. Can you think of something more gross? Well, we've got some more plagues coming, but frogs everywhere. You know, if you kiss one, of course, they'll turn into a prince, right? I mean, we have that in our heads, that there's something really gross, but maybe there's something good about our vanity, our need for approval our desire to be light, our ability to do fascinating things. Think about a frog. They do fascinating things. And we know that amphibians, actually, in the natural world, are like the canary in the mine. If the amphibians, if the frogs and the salamanders are disappearing from our landscape, we know things are going bad in our environment. 
because they live right close to the earth. They're breathing, they're living in the water and on the land, right in the dirt. So it's a great correspondence for what they are, but when they come in and they infest us, it's like us wanting to just stay in the dirt and think our life is there. Like a serpent, like a frog, like a salamander. Our life isn't there. But our minds can convince us, ah, oh, nature, how sweet it is, which it is. But if we stay there, we become captivated. It's like the plague of the frogs. The thought turning in our mind that this is great. Don't I look good? I'm in the natural world. There's a vanity, there's an allurement, and there's a lack of recognition that this is a tool, this is an instrument, this world. And the Lord has to lead us to see it for what it's worth, and not live in it as if it's everything. We need to be released from that thinking. Frogs taking over our lives. And lice. Are you comfortable in your own spiritual skin? The lice are told correspond or represent to uh, an external thinking about ourselves, even when we have knowledge of spiritual things. And all these plagues interrelate to one another. Basically, they're all the plagues of living in the natural world, thinking the natural world is everything there is. I'm the most important. God really doesn't exist and takes care of me. And then the sink appear in different forms like lice. Just think about how itchy that would be. Think about what it would be if you play with you're living in your externals and yet they keep bothering you. You want something better. You want something better. Always after something more comfortable, more pleasing. Ugh. Just don't, you're not comfortable in your own skin. Not being content with our lot. One of the plagues of life. Not being content with our law. This is who I am. This is what the Lord has given me. I will try to be content with these gifts. Not that person's gifts and that person's gifts. I need to be content and live comfortably in my own spiritual skin. For those of you who like these Latin words from the Third Testament, your own limits. Flies come. The plague of flies. You know, flies are bad enough without them being a plague. But imagine them being everywhere. It's not like the frog. It's not like all of these. It's everywhere. It's taken over your life. And it's a way of the Lord giving us, and it never happens, but it happened then. It never happens to us and that's all we can think about, is it? Well, it hopefully will happen. That as you spiritually mature, you will go, ow, every time I think, I'm thinking about me. Wow, every time I, every time I'm wondering about something, I think what well, I, I get more. Flies all the time appear. For the thoughts that come into our head all the time. The Lord can free us of all of these plagues. And later on in the teaching of the Arcana about these plagues, it says that not everyone is purified and never has these things happen again. But it's an overall state where we stop living in Egypt. And we're not plagued by these things. The livestock that all the livestock that all die represent those things that are supposed to serve us in our daily lives, like our jobs. Our jobs are to serve us, and we have these jobs so that we can serve others. That's the spiritual good balance. But if we put all of our lives in just making money and having jobs and having positions of responsibility, or doing something for other people praised or being counted or being admired or being respected. The Lord's going to kill that livestock before you can hear to progress. You have to stop seeing yourself as so important. You have to quit being the big bull, the big person that pulls things around. You have to stop being the fancy horse, the beautiful that, that sense of being admired. All of these have to do with some level of vanity. The livestock, killing all the livestock, just represents the Lord has to bring us into a state where we realize it's His life that lives, not those things that we think we own that make us look so good. In the natural world, it's easy to pick on 
wanting to have status by your house looking this way, your car looking that way, your living room looking this way. And like, it's so easy to just use that as a cliche, and yet it's part of the story. That has to die. And the thing is, all of these things, some of them are which are good and some are bad. Nobody wants flies. Flies do serve a purpose. Nobody wants lice. It does serve a purpose. Of course, moving on, nobody wants oils. But they do serve a purpose. If there's something infecting your skin, it will produce a oil. And that lets the infection out. It's a good process. As yucky as it is to contemplate the sermon in church, to have nothing but boils means that basically, us of ourselves, we are nothing but evil. And we have to be reminded of that. It has to, as it were, plague us just a little bit if we're going to let it die within us. If we want to hang on and hold on to the idea that we live as of our, we live from ourselves, not as if from ourselves, then we're living in just Boil. It's just an infected thought and it's just an infected spiritual life. We don't have any life as of ourselves. And we can't accept and celebrate the Lord's coming to us unless we put that aside and come to the Lord clean and honest. Lord, we need you and all you are. Hail falls down from the sky as hard bits of what's otherwise beautiful water. Hard, chunky things that can destroy the way we can often beat up on ourselves and beat up on others with the truth and devastate somebody, devastate somebody, and feel like the Lord is trying to devastate us. By all this truth, this whole hard truth that can wipe out everything that we live from, the hail wiped out, as did the locusts, the wheat, the ability to be fed. And when we take the truth that we have and all the things of the Christmas story and we use them to perfectly create this scenario or scene in our lives, and then we're looking at that, admiring it for what a wonderful job we've done and getting ready for the Lord to come into our lives, and if we compare anybody else and go, well, they missed putting the word where it should be in their house this season, or they didn't actually um, have the right kind of sentiment towards capitalism. Well, you didn't see them in the church on Christmas Eve, and I wonder if they came on Christmas Day. When we start thinking about other people like that, it's a plague of hail in our own lives to take the truth the Lord's given us and try to apply it to other people like that. We're bombarding them. And we need to be relieved of that in ourselves. We need to pray to the Lord, Lord, help me not do that with all the truth, with all the externals that you've given me. This is all happening in Egypt, a place of external learning and science. Not to use those things against other people. Because eventually, and of course originally, we're using it or it's being used against us by the hells. When the locusts come, they just devour all of our spiritual desires. We can look at it externally and go, of course, it's a terrible thing. But a lot of these things, and the darkness comes next, a lot of these things we become so immured what's happening within our spirits that we hardly begin to notice. The locusts eating up what the hail had to destroy or what it had destroyed, covering the land. Locusts upon the land are like the oils and the lice and the flies upon the body. Covering everything. Covering all that we are in our natural lives. And eating up everything that would nourish us. And it leads to a state of darkness. Wake up! And some of you, of course, need to be woken up, but I won't point you out. Wake up! Because the one thing that hell would like you to do is to sleep through all of this. Just go, what's he talking about? Why is the Lord repeat the same thing over and over? I've heard this before. I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to love the Lord. Well, that's good if you're on that track. You need to continue to wake up. You need to continue to have night followed by day. Because it's so easy just to slip into a perpetual night 
of thinking, I've heard this before, I know this, and I keep doing my, I keep doing the same thing over and over again. Of course you need to repent from evils and sins over and over again. But oftentimes, we're actually letting ourselves slip into a state where we're not making progress. We're never going to escape. The Lord has to have us escape in that day of darkness. The day of realizing not the Lord's help, I'm not going to see anything new. The final plague is the death of the firstborn. And it means that we have, by this point, spiritually speaking, we all reach this point of thinking that our faith will save us. I went to church, I heard what he had to say, yeah, I believe it all, that's great. On some level, we en enter into a faith alone state. Which is why the remedy to that is the slaying, you know, of course in the culture of that time, appropriate, the slaying of a kid or a lamb, a male, to represent the truth. And the innocence, the blood, on the lamb or the, the lintels to represent the innocence that we have to enter into our homes with this innocence and love from the Lord in the form of truth. And recognize the truth and stay awake to that truth, lest the firstborn in us perish. The firstborn should be the Lord God Jesus Christ. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. This is the first commandment. The second, like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. That should be the firstborn. Instead of, I know all these things, I've heard them a million times. Yeah, another Christmas season is going to be a hassle, but I'll go. There's something in us that wants to go there, and we need to renew and come out of the darkness into a light where we say, My goodness, I'm glad the Lord has saved me. My goodness, I'm glad the Lord sees all these details about my spiritual life. He has me covered. There's nothing that He didn't go through, there's nothing I'm going through that He hasn't already saved me from. So the text we've taken is from Zephaniah, where the Lord says, I'm going to place this in you, a miserable, a miserable remnant, poor and needy, but they will know the name of the Lord. The remnant the Lord gives us, the remains, all the things that we're now receiving during this worship service, all worship services, your meditations, your own reading, the Lord is implanting in you all the power of Himself that can save you. Because we can't save ourselves whatsoever. We can only plague ourselves and pray the Lord would leave us of these prayers. So the power that the Lord gives us to the remains, the ten plagues that and the ten ways in which the Lord gives us remains, number ten, all standing for remains. But the Lord gives us what we need to be redeemed and saved. And we thank the Lord with all of our hearts that He has come and done this to save us. Amen. Only God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and dominion forever.